Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Dangerous Games Podcast. I am Courtney from Reckless Cards and I am here with the incomparable Oh, you're going to say incompetent. Incompetent. No, the incomparable, the beautiful, the enigmatic, the stunning, the perfect, the light of my life, the original Mrs. Breaker, Mrs. Squirt's Cards, Sarah. What's up, Sarah? How are you doing, girl? I'm good. How are you, babe? I'm good. I'm good. It's It's been a long day. I've recorded like 22 podcasts, I feel like, and I am here. I am bucking up through one last one, and then I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> and then I think you should. I, I think I will. I, think <laughs> I will. I bought a new TV for my bedroom, which I like, we've never been like big bedroom TV people, but like with all the children that I have now, I, like if I want to like go quietly watch a show, I have to have a door. Yep. And it has so, to be able to lock. Yeah. So that's where I'm at. I have a TV in my bedroom now. It's beautiful and I love it. And it has all of my favorite shows on it. So I'll probably go upstairs, curl up, watch a little true crime until I fall asleep. <laughs> that's how I I'm, do it. I'm that level of crazy. Yes, we are. So um, if you watched last week's episode, uh, I'm not sure actually because we'll have done LT. And then if I got the Tanya Harding one, that one will have gone up next. And then this will be the one after that. Yeah, you so, were mentioning something about um, a catcher, like a like yes. an older catcher and the LT one. Yeah, that, that you were bringing. It, I mean, like, how far back are we going? Old? We're going way, way back. Um, hmm. This man was born in 1871. So this is he was born in 1871. He committed his crimes in literally 1900. Wow, like, 1900 crime. You say crime, so you're saying crime. more the. More it than one, one crime. It was one crime. It mm. was one. It was one day. Several crimes. Oh, so like a, a mass murder or yes, like a mass murder. something crazy. We're, we are doing some. This is something that if had had this happened in this day and age, mm-hmm. it would have been an insane media frenzy. People would have been hmm. so shocked. Now it's kind of faded into obscurity. A lot of people haven't heard of this case, which to me is, yeah. is is wild because he was a professional baseball player. Now this was before the formation of the MLB. Because well, okay. If you've been following us, that that's, that was formed in 1903. So this is before that in 1900. But we're getting really close. Um, it happened in Boston. Okay. And this is like pre-Boston Red Sox even. Oh, so whoa. Yes. So wow. Yep. We're going to get into it. This is the case of Martin Burden. Oh, Martin. Martin. Better known as Marty. Everyone called him Oh, okay. His brother was actually a professional baseball player as well. Marty doesn't have, like, Marty has cards, but Mm -hmm. they are so rare. I ordered a picture, like a legitimate picture of him that, like, I'm going to have and I'll get it framed and stuff, but Mm -hmm. his cards are impossible. I might I might get one of his brother's Bill Bergen's cards. So, oh, so at least it's close. Yeah, and it's a relative. And there's... was Bill younger or older? Sorry, I didn't know. If you it's said his that. younger brother. Gotcha. So. Okay. All right. So historical records, especially those related to individuals from the late 19th century, can be limited, um, and details about their early lives may not be well documented or even publicly accessible. This is the case for Marty. I don't have a ton of information about his younger life, but we know that Marty Bergen was born on October 25th, 1871 in North Brookfield, Massachusetts. So he was a mass hole. (laughs) Um, His parents were Michael and Ann Delaney Bergen. They were Irish immigrants who um, had arrived in the United States just after the Civil War. Michael was made an income for the family by making shoes at a local factory. So he was a shoemaker at a local factory. Hmm. Martin was the third of six children. Six. Six. Yes. He had all sisters except for his youngest brother, Bill, William Bill. Bill was also an infamous baseball player, but for an entirely different reason than his brother. Bill was a fine defense. He was a fine defensive catcher, but his dubious claim to fame was that he he was um, offensively inept. Oh. Yeah. No one played in the major leagues as long as Bill Bergen and hit so poorly. 
<laughs> Bergen yeah. had 3,028 career at bats, during which he compiled a battering average of 0.170. Whoa. 516. Oh my God. 3,028, to be clear. He only hit 520, 516 for 3,000 at bats. How does that, how do you stay on a team? He's so bad. He was a very, very, very good catcher. So, yeah, but that doesn't, like nowadays, that wouldn't fly. Like, even if you're a really good, good catcher, if you can't hit the dang thing. I don't know. Remember, this is the dead ball era, uh, so maybe yeah. they didn't care as much. A record low for four, uh, it was a record low for players with more than 25,000 plate appearances. Marty, on the other hand, now that was Bill. Marty, who this is who we're talking about today, mm -hmm. um, was and is considered to be one of the greatest defensive catchers of all time. In 1900, Hall of Fame outfielder Jesse Burkett praised Bergen, considering him the best catcher in baseball history. Wow. Marty began his professional baseball career in 1896 with the Boston Bean Eaters. The Around what? The Boston Bean Eaters. Oh, God. This is this is going to be on the, up there with the freaking glove finger thing from yeah. Tanya Harding, where yeah, there's no... Oh, man. Bean sense. Eaters. Around 1892, okay, so we're going to go back, we're going to... 1882, okay. So in 19, or in 1896, he started playing with the Bean Eaters, okay? We're going to back up a little bit to 1892, and we're going to talk about Harriet Hattie Gaines. Okay. She was a few years older than Marty, and she mm -hmm. moved from New York State to North Brookfield seeking work at a local shoe factory. Oh, maybe where his dad works. Maybe she became a boarder at the home of Rufus and Maria Ingram on Central Street. Okay, so as a boarder, just like somebody, just like basically so renting a place. Days, it was like if somebody owned a house, everybody was like super poor. So you would board with somebody, so you'd like rent a room. Right. So it's yeah. it's like renting nowadays. Yeah. Gotcha. Hattie and Bergen met in Worcester and got married in wow. 1893. After their wedding, they moved into the Ingram home. So he moved in with her, you know, mm -hmm. where they were boarding. A few years later, the Bergens bought a small farm known as Snowball Farm on, Boy on Boynton Street. So isn't that cute? Nope. They got married. And Hattie, by all accounts, was beautiful. Like a very beautiful girl. Um, so, and they bought that house, like, not far from where Hattie had been boarding with uh, mm. the Ingrams. Okay. Okay. This property included a modest one and a half story house, which became the family's home. Mm -hmm. The couple had three children. Wow. Martin. Martin was Martin Jr. was born around 1894. Florence, born in either 1894 or 1895. I could I couldn't like it was weird. It said different things mm -hmm. at different times. So so like either they had a baby back to back in the same right. year or one like very so I, i'm thinking maybe like december of 80 of like 94 or january of 95 and joseph born in again either 96 or 97 it okay. was up there so young yeah unfortunately the ac exact ages of the children are unclear due to the descriptions you know discrepancies in various articles and again this is like over 123 years ago yeah and their deaths occurred before the census would be taken so it was like really, it was really hard. Like it's crazy to think that this story is about people that were like around before we even did censuses. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. Like when did that start? You know, I should look. I'm not sure. Uh, I think yeah, it was I'll, like, I'll, I'll Google it while you. You'll Google it while you're. According to Mrs. Ingram, Hattie was a pleasant woman, and Bergen was often fuzzy, fussy, and continuously finding fault with his wife. Despite this, though, Hattie seemed to, to rarely express any discontent with their marriage. So they seemed like pretty happily married. Um, you know, Marty started traveling for the baseball, like for for things, and they wanted him to move closer. And Hattie did not want to. So that did cause some conflict for him. Mm -hmm. because You know, he had this beautiful young wife and his family and they lived kind of like he was away from them a lot with his work for baseball. Mm. So now we're going to jump forward into, you know, now we know he was a, his brother played, he was married, he had these three children, he bought a farm, but 
The landscape of sports in the 1900s was such that the Boston Bean Eaters, who eventually became the Braves, were the only professional sports team in the city. Oh, wow. The Red Sox franchise was still over a year away from its inaugural season. So the Red Sox were started in like 1901. Okay, so I found the census thing. Okay, and what, what's the census? So this is crazy. It actually started in 1790, but due to a fire um, in 19... So, the, so a lot of them got lost up to 1890. And then okay. the ones of 1890 were burned in a fire at the U.S. Department of Commerce Building in Washington, D.C. in 1921. So even if there was census for any of this, we're not, we're, you wouldn't even know it. Yeah, they got lost. Because everything got either stolen or um, lost or destroyed by fire. It's so wild it's how much like, documented, like people lost. Wow, that's crazy. And how accurate could it be in 1790? Who was like doing the census? Were they like doing it on So it's school? crazy. It was like um, they were about three or four months behind um, for the 1790 census. And then they required everybody to have the information in by August 2nd. Mm. And it's and it's just like, or, like a little group that did it. So how accurate anything is at that point, I mean. I just like, how did they get it to D.C.? Like the Pony Express? Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> the fact that we have records from these times when you really think about how, like, it's like a quill a quill and a scroll <laughs> like it's i just don't i don't or like rock and chisel, chisel. <laughs> <laughs> my kids think that's how i used to write in the 90s so i don't my my kids call like they're like my mom went to high school in the late 90s or in the late 1900s i'm like shut up i, I mean it's stuff. true i i didn't i went in the early 2000s but Still, I mean, like being in school in the 1900s is apparently a cool thing nowadays. There you go. Let's go. So, um, yeah, the Red Sox did not exist. The National League team uh, had the area's baseball fans all to itself. So the Bean Eaters were the National League's uh, pride and joy in Boston. Bean Eaters. The Bean Eaters. I need a shirt that says that. <laughs> Bergen had debuted with the with Boston in 1896. So this was like after, like right around the birth of his last child. Okay. Um, and had been an integral part of the National League Championship teams of 97 and 98. So the Bean Eaters won the National Championship in 97 and 98. Bergen primarily played as a catcher for the Bean Eaters and was known for his defensive skills and a powerful arm. He was an insanely talented pitcher or catcher. He played a total of 344 games with the team. Now think about the fact that his brother played like literally 10 times more games. Yes, he did. Um, with the team, with 337 of those being in the catcher position. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. During his time with the Bean Eaters, the team achieved significant success. For example, when they won the championships, you know, in, seven, in 97 and 98, as well as finishing in second place in 1899. Okay. He was considered a nimble fielder with an exceptional throwing abilities. Capable. Now think about this. If you if you like baseball, he was able to throw the ball to second base from home without moving his feet. Whoa. Yeah. That's some power behind that throw. Yes. That's and crazy. It's sort of heinous when you think about what he did. He ends up doing with how strong he is as a person. Does he use his hands? You make it sound like he's going to use his hands. He doesn't. So everyone knew what a skilled baseball player Marty was, but he faced challenges in his interactions with teammates due to his often moody and sarcastic demeanor. Um, I feel like listening to someone call someone moody and sarcastic. I'm like, well, that's me. <laughs> so that's me too. that doesn't mean anything. People can be moody. And I sarcastic. guess I'm going to become a murderer. I know. While his initial strong arm and energetic playing style were appreciated, his behavior caused friction within the team. Mm. In 1899, Bergen's mental health began to decline significantly mm -hmm. after undergoing hip surgery in January. So he when he underwent hip surgery, and now think about what surgery was like in the in like the late yeah. 1900s. It was not a great situation. Like they, but like they didn't know what they were doing. They did some scary bone sawing kind of. I surgery. wonder if that kind of messed with his like ability. Well, obviously his ability to play, but maybe mentally 
his longevity too. I, I'm not sure, but like some people said that he broke his hip and that's why he had to have surgery. There wasn't really any documentation of like what exactly the surgery was for other than he was injured and he had to have surgery. Wow. After that, he experienced a change in his mental state marked by troubling hallucinations where he believed that enemies were attempting to poison him. So think about this. Maybe they did a bad job of like putting him under and he was already kind of like a moody person. And then like, maybe he like lacked oxygen for a certain amount of time and it affected him. I don't know. Um, The bean eaters began their season with a series of road games. And during that period, Bergen received the heartbreaking news that his son, his youngest son, Joseph had died from diphtheria. Yeah, while he was on the road. Understandably, Bergen took some time off to recover from the loss, but upon his return, the strain relationships with his teammates persisted and like got significantly worse. So now he's had the surgery, he's having hallucinations, he thinks people are poisoning him. While he's away, his son dies, and he's just he like he is having problems at this point. Bergen's mental struggles manifested in various ways. He became increasingly paranoid, imagining these teammates were making jokes about the death of his son behind his back. He developed a peculiar behavior such as sitting sideways and and adopting a particular walking style to stay vigilant against imagined assassins approaching from either side. So his teammates would talk about like watching him walk and how he looked they they say peculiar but like they would like describe him as like very off base and strange i wonder like, what like walking mm. like this so like he could see people like at, like so he could see as big of a vantage point as he could get like it what if he had like an infection or something like that from the surgery so, that caused him to be or uh, like some kind of aneurysm that affected his mm-hmm. brain The team's management worried about Bergen's behavior. They urged his fellow players to keep their distance. He was so good, though, that they didn't want to, like, take him off the team. But they were like, yeah, he's weird. Just stay away from him. Um, They were concerned about, like, the consequences of, like, his behavior. Some attributed his condition to heavy drinking, while others considered him, Mm. uh, like, just crazy. Yeah. Now, there wasn't really any proof that he was a drinker. <laughs> That's the thing is, like, he acted weird mm. and because they didn't have, like, mental health care. Or, like, they even acknowledged that something was wrong with him. They're just like, oh, he's a drunk. Um, in July of 1899, Bergen silently walked off the team's train during a road trip, returning to his hometown of North Brookfield, Massachusetts. This move left the Bean Eaters with only a backup catcher for a crucial stretch of games. A Boston Globe reporter attempted to persuade Bergen to rejoin the team, but Bergen's complaints about mistreatment from teammates, the lack of time to be with his family, and physical injuries left, you know, they led to a challenging situation because he was, like, unhappy. Mm. Which all of these sound like reasonable things right. to be unhappy about, you know, but the, the challenges with his teammates were just in his head because they were all trying to, like, just kind of stay away from him, not cause problems. Like Although, maybe like some schizophrenia or something. It's kind of just wait because people have done like, like there's a few doctors that like went back and like mm. they like, you know, you can't really diagnose someone from the past, but they went over the case right. and they have some opinions about this. Ooh, interesting. Although he eventually rejoined the team, his behavior remained erratic. In September, he disappeared for a few days, showing up unannounced shortly before a game, wearing his catcher's gear and refraining from speaking to anyone. So he just disappeared, and then he shows up before a game all dressed in his gear. By October, Bergen's mental state had deteriorated to the point where he couldn't catch pitches, dodging them as if wow. in avoiding an, ass- an assailant with a knife. So he'd be like, like, he couldn't even do his job anymore. Bergen was aware of his declining mental health, and he sought help from both clergy and physicians. Like, he thought he was possessed. He went to the doctor. Mm-hmm. He did try to get help. Like, this is important. He did try a lot of times to get help. But if you don't know what's going on, and back then they didn't have these type of diagnoses or diagnoses that we have now. So, like, how do you – I see people and I hear things and and I feel this way, but they're going to look at you like, okay, like, I don't know how to treat you because they don't know how to treat that. They did So – and the other problem with this is that he was very distrustful of prescribed medications. Remember, he thinks everyone's trying to poison him. Correct. Um, fearing that he, I mean, he, he 
feared taking medicine because he thought it would harm him. He refused medication that his wife was trying to give him, believing that it might be poison that was like orchestrated by someone within the National League. Like he was very convinced that they were trying to poison him. And after his son's death, um, he would like frequently request permission from this manager, Frankie Soleil, to return home for a few days, often despite Soleil's refusal. He was burdened by the reminders of his son from his teammates and revengeful of a $300 fine for being absent without leave. By the end of the year, most of his teammates were avoiding him, like 100%. And several expressed reluctance to continue playing for the Bean Eaters um, in the upcoming season if Bergen remained on the team. Like, they're like, if you keep him, right. we're walking. His increasingly erratic behavior was significant concern for the club and his fellow players. So he had gotten to the point where, like, nobody wanted to, to play with him anymore. Um, while numerous people considered the day Babe Ruth was sold to the Yankees as the darkest day in Bo uh, Boston sports history, the actions of Marty Bergen might indeed be its most tragic. Wow. Sadly, as it would turn out, Bergen would not return to the team for the 1900 season. January 19th. 1900 he would take his own life but in a way that was so horrific and catastrophic it would still to this day be considered one of the darkest days in boston sports history on the night of january 18th 1900 a thursday the bergen family enjoyed a hearty dinner the following morning the sink was filled with dishes indicating a satisfying meal though the cupboards were rather empty the family went to bed with beds clearly slept in. It's assumed that sometime in the early morning, um, and this is all just based on what the house looked like the next day, Bergen, experiencing stress and delusions, arose and began his day. He cleared the ashes from the stove from the big dinner from the night before, which had cooled overnight, and prepared to light a, a new fire using paper, though he had retrieved wood from outside. As the inside pile was depleted, this is sort of the setup of like how the the tragic events happen. So he goes to light the fire. There's no wood. He goes mm. outside to get wood. Mm. The horrifying events then unfolded. Bergen, in a delusional state, began attacking his family. According to the medical examiner's opinion, he first assaulted his wife in what was likely one of the children's rooms. He struck her repeatedly in the head with the blunt side of an ax, which is what he went outside to get the firewood with. Um, she fell dying on one of the twin beds. Next, he struck his son with the sharp side of the ax, causing him to die on the bed as well. In the kitchen, Bergen killed his daughter, again using the blunt end of the ax. Bergen then took a razor standing in front of the mirror in the kitchen, indi indicated by blood splatter evidence, um, mm. and proceeded to slice his own throat, nearly severing his head. He fell uh, and died beside his daughter. Around 9 a.m. on January 19th, Michael Bergen, Marty's father, who lived nearby, came to the house looking for some milk. He discovered the gruesome scene, and after regaining his composure, informed his daughter, Margaret, and son, William, who were neighbors of the soon-to-be-mentioned uh, Arnold Wallace. Michael Bergen then made his way to retrieve the police and Constable Ar uh, Arnold F. Wallace. So he was also a neighbor. These people all live very close to each mm -hmm. other. He was uh, a lot older. He was like 57. And he took charge of the situation Medical examiner E. W. Norwood was called to assist in the tragedy. On the 20th, the house was cleaned. The bodies were placed in coffins and laid out in the Bergen home for family and friends to view. So, like, back in the old days, they did the funerals just, like, right in the house. So they cleaned all the blood. They put the bodies in coffins and just, like, oh. laid them in the house where they were all, like, murdered together. Ooh. Mm -mm. Burn the house. Yeah. That is, that is crazy. I know. So after which they were transported to St. Joseph's Church for funeral ceremonies, the family was interned 
in the adjoining Catholic cemetery, but notably, Marty was not given the last rites of the Catholic face. Well, that doesn't surprise me. He, well, he you, murdered. Yeah, well, you murdered and he committed suicide. I think had he not killed himself when he died, he could still get rights. It was because he committed suicide. Whoa, man. At the funeral from Major League Baseball, only Connie Mack and Billy Hamilton, a teammate, attended. Other Boston bean eaters, including Arthur Sodden, Frank Slee, uh, team captain Hugh Duffy, and the rest of the team were confused about the date of the funeral, mistakenly believing it was scheduled for the following day on the 21st. So they were going to go mm. their sex, but they just didn't know the date. Paul Bearers for Bergen included a mix of local ball players, friends, and former teammates. So like people still showed up for him. His brother uh, was not one of his ball players, though. So William B. Conroy, a ball player, John Hintz, a ball player, William McNamara, a former That's teammate. interesting that I mean, I guess because you know he had such a attitude and he he acted so strange. It's interesting that anybody showed up for him, and then let alone he literally murdered his family I know. that did nothing and took his own life, and yet there's still people there that's carrying him. I know. It's crazy. So what's wild, too, is you talked about, like, burn the house. Remarkably, mm -hmm. the estate auction was conducted within a week of the tragic deaths. Heck no. Yes. Mm -mm. Bergen had only paid $300 on the farm. This is crazy. So yeah. he still owed only $1,650. He had no life insurance, but there was uh, $2,600 $2, in cash in like, the house. So they were able to like pay off all of his debts. And everything. I was going to say, he, he has no family. He has no necks of kin. He Nothing. Yeah. This. There's like $1,000 left. I don't know. Maybe his brothers and sisters all split it. Oh, my gosh. So... All of the, you were talking about people showing up and like that you thought that was crazy and everything. Mm -hmm. well, Marty actually received a few Hall of Fame votes in 1937 and in 1939. What? Yeah. Not nearly enough to be elected, but the fact that he had gotten votes at all was crazy to me. This is like the LT of baseball, um, you know, like where you just think that, that yes, they're a good player. But they're not a good person. I I think I feel like had this happened now, not he had had he help. had what he had now, he yeah. might have been able to get the help, and maybe this wouldn't have happened. Agree. So now it's been <laughs> hundred and twenty three years, just a few days since the tragic murder suicide, and it has faded from the memory of the baseball public. Sinking into obscurity. A lot of people have never even heard of this case. But could you imagine the immense media frenzy if it were happened in today's world? Like what it would be like? Picture an all-star athlete in the peak of their life and career, a prominent figure in one of the country's most successful professional sports teams, mm -hmm. committing such a horrifying act of psychopathic rage against their own family. Such a distressing event would likely give rise to a movie, books, um, oh, yeah. central topic of discussion across numerous television. I mean, it would be on every mm -hmm. newspaper, radio, whatever. We don't have radio anymore, really, but you know what I mean. Sounds like almost Podcasts. like a Hernandez situation. Yeah. What's worse is today he would have been able to get the help he needed. Yeah. Because in addition to paranoia, Martin Bergen most likely suffered from schizophrenia with a yeah. touch of manic depression. Dr. Carl Salzman, professor of psychi uh, psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, who examined various contemporary accounts of Bergen's behavior, schizophrenia uh, was what he said. He said he would almost guarantee that that was what he would diagnose him with. Um, it can be marked by delusions such as Bergman experience, a belief that something is happening that isn't, and usually threatening. Other symptoms are withdrawal, inability to socialize, or fear of socializing, flat or dull feelings, not in the usual range of expression of emotion and difficulty mm -hmm. thinking and controlling one's thoughts. It's a brain disease that causes the person to be more vulnerable to the unusual stresses of life. Yep. Today, someone like Bergen would have been treated with drugs and psychotherapy, but mm -hmm. at the turn of the last century, there weren't any medications to treat this illness. Um, 
there was no psychotherapy. Many people with Bergen symptoms were put in hospitals or just locked up. Wow. I mean, that's kind of what we do nowadays too, you know? Yeah. They're just criminal or whatever. At least there's it, yeah. an option. We haven't help. come that far in 123 Correct. years. The only medica uh, medication Bergen seems to have been prescribed were bromides, which are just mild sedatives. So the only thing that he ever got were, mm -hmm. and that was if he took them, because remember, he was scared to take medicine. Right. Um, and they were commonly used at that time to just quiet people down, especially if they were anxious or had trouble sleeping. So it's just like... It's like taking a Xanax, you know? Yep. Or a sleeping pill. Yeah. Again, against uh, Bergen's afflictions, though, bromides were worthless. Yeah. Sounds like it. So it's really sad. And he just, what, what happened to him and what he did is something that now would be preventable. Right. You know? I think that's the hard part about some of these cases, especially the older ones. You know, we talked about a couple whenever the LT one gets released about how, um, you know, the, we like players and having to see them commit crimes and how that affects us on a personal level. But then you see the you hear about these crime, it, these situations where it's like nowadays they'd have so much help and so much uh, they'd be better off nowadays. Yeah. And, you just you it hurts because it's like man we babies and his wife i mean and like they're already dealing with the situation of a diphtheria back then and just all these other well-known easy to take out a family on its own yeah. you know and it, it just it hurts because it's so much stuff can be prevented nowadays that couldn't be 100 years ago and we've come a long way it's just not far enough yet so i did a little research after this because mm -hmm. i was curious about the whole family annihilator type situation right like what drives people to kill their whole family and stuff and actually there's like a lot of information about it and mm -hmm. so family annihilators are in individuals who commit acts of violence that result in the killing of multiple members of their own family often followed by a suicide you know of the right. perpetrator the motives and characteristics of family annihilators can vary, but they are um, they have some like patterns. Like there's specific patterns to the types of family annihilators that there are. Um, it's important to note that these are general trends, and not all family annihilators fit neatly right. into the categories. But there are let me see six types, and so I'm gonna go over the six types really quickly, just because I found this interesting, and in this like in in this. Uh, genre of like sports criminals that we're kind of talking about there just aren't a lot of family annihilators it's correct not, it's not something that you see very often so there's the pseudo uh, um altruistic okay so these perpetrators believe that they are acting out of a twisted sense of love or protection for their family they may believe that their family members are better off dead you mm -hmm. see that a lot with like moms mm -hmm. that are going through like postpartum and they think their yeah. children are being they, they, their children are being like uh, possessed by the devil or something. <sighs> or they may see actions as a way to spare their family from suffering, um, such as financial difficulties or perceived impending crisis. It reminds me of the um, Valo. Valo? Tori, or what's her name? The lady that killed her, both her kids because she believed that the end of time was coming. Yeah. That was just recently. Yeah. It, it's, it's a lot of brainwashing. It's a lot of... Um, uh, man yeah these are interesting I, I, i'm really excited to hear the rest of them i just like when you said that like that's the first thing that came to my mind was that I think recent we can, case. Like, back to cases and fit someone into each of these really. it's crazy so anomic anomic family annihilators are driven by a sense of failure often related to financial personal mm -hmm. difficulties they may perceive their family as a burden Gotcha. Um, yep. And their act of killing them is seen as a way to escape the pressures and responsibilities they feel. So that would be someone mm. like, uh, what was that guy who killed his wife, his pregnant wife, and his two little girls? Yep. Yep. In Utah. Or, Chris, uh, yep. I can see him. The two little girls and his pregnant wife. Oh, my God. Her name was Shannon. And I can't uh -huh. remember. His name was Chris. Uh, but yeah, that was definitely 
in my opinion, he fit. And so some of these are not necessarily they take their lives. This is just no a, a lot of times the they, families. They're the people who kill their families. Gotcha. It's very often a suicide afterwards, but not necessarily always. right. Like specifically, the anomic ones are the ones that are like they they find their family to be a burden, and they just it, rather than like you know just get a divorce, they were like, oh, I'm just gonna kill everyone. Oh my god! So yeah, so, paranoid. I think this is Marty. Mm. These individuals may suffer from delusions of paranoia, believing that their family is involved in a conspiracy against them. Like he literally said that he was scared his wife was trying to poison him. Um, or they may fear that their family members would turn against them. The killings are often seen as a way to uh, eliminate a perceived threat. Mm. Disappointed. Uh, these individuals may have unrealistic expectations for their family, and when they in reality doesn't meet their expectations, they respond with extreme violence. This type is often associated with cases where the perpetrator feels betrayed or rejected. This is like the oh, Lord. "if I can't have you, nobody can" kind of killer. Yeah, those are those are the scary ones. I mean, they they're all scary, but those ones are really, really scary. So revenge is uh, someone. Some family annihilators commit these acts as a form of revenge against a spouse or a partner mm. in response to a perceived injustice or betrayal. Their goal may be to cause surviving family members to suffer emotionally. Uh, filicide, suicide. This category includes perpetrators who commit filicide, the killing of one's own child, before or during their own suicide. This type can have a range of motivations, including the belief that the family is better off dead or desire to punish the spouse or partner. So think like Susan Smith. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man. And I think it was, was it uh, Watts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Watts was the last name. I'm from I Colorado. To me. They're from or Colorado, you. not Utah, but, you know. Something. Oh, like the Western state. Western states. Oh, Lord. It's important to recognize that each case is unique and there can be a combination of factors contributing to these tragic events. Mental health issues, domestic violence, substance abuse, and other stressors can also play a role in family annihilators' actions. These categories are not exhaustive, but they provide a general framework for understanding the motivations behind such tragic events. Um, and that's based on like all like available research at this time. So I just found that really interesting that there were like there has been enough cases of stuff like this happening that they have like branched it out into like you know, so categories. Crazy. I think the ones that really shocked me are the ones that and it's always shocked me even before you know you bringing it up but, but kind of putting all the pieces together um, are the ones that murder their family and stay around because they feel like their family is a burden. And it, it's like, it is so easy to just get divorced and just peace out. But I know that even that's a burden. And then having to take care of the kids is still a burden on them. So like, child, like they just get rid of all of it. Money. But then it's like, you're going to go to jail because of it? Like They think they're going to get away with it in those cases, I think. You I know, think like, so and like Cases like Marty Bergen, where like someone's like legitimately has mental illness uh, and like, might not have been in control of his faculties at the time of this happening is absolutely tragic, but it is nowhere near as heinous, in my opinion, as someone right. like Chris Watts, who just wants to be single and do whatever he wants and wants to have the pity of people thinking that his wife like left him or had was stolen, or then he tried to spin it around that like she killed the girls because she found out he was having an affair. affair. Yeah. yeah. And then he goes on with his life, and it's just like, why? You why know do these people do did. this? Mm -hmm. you, you like you could have left. Is, I, is there there's an amount of money that's more valuable to you than your children's lives? Like you don't want to pay child support. They have to be so disconnected at that point, as like like at that point, as a parent, I can't, I cannot uh, even be on the same level as that. Um, but. In order to get to that level, I feel like you have to be completely disconnected where it's like you don't even call them your kids anymore. They're just they're just there. They're just entities in your mind. Because how in the world do you snap like that to the point where you premeditate it, you have it all written out, all figured out, and then you like walk away like they never existed? I don't get it. And it really 
I, I would like, you know, this is what there has to be something wrong with you, right? There has, mm -hmm. there has to be like no normal, like Correct. there's a difference between like, you know, we're like uh, an insanity plea or whatever, but no normal person who's like, and I hate the word normal, no like mentally sound person can look at their children and be like, yeah, I'm going to kill you. Like there has to be something inherently deeply wrong. But it you know, goes with the, what you said before about, you know, postpartum. I don't think men don't understand like how that that does happen and it creeps up and it comes fast. And if you don't get a hold of it, it almost possesses you. There is. I mean, there's a difference between like postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. And they've mm -hmm. proven that. Can you imagine like having like a mental snap as like a mother doing something horrible like that and then getting the treatment that you should have gotten? And then coming back around and realizing and what, realizing you what did. you've done. Yep. Yeah. I, as a mother and I, 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 there was nights where I got really tired and you just, you're, you're burnt out. And I've, you know, luckily enough was able to see it and was able to tell, you know, E like, Hey, you need to take the baby for the night. Um, I need a breather. And yeah. I think that women now have more resources. And I know this is getting off topic and, oh, yeah. but it's, it's definitely, you want to talk about something that's scary. That is a very scary situation where the women snap. We have a term family annihilator. Yeah, that's true. Is, like that's a scary thing that we live in. A there's women who have drowned their kids. Yeah. Because yeah. of like the the unmedicated help that they needed. Yeah. And it could be the fifth child that cracks them. Yeah. But they've taken out families, and it, it's just. Mm -hmm. It's mm, true. This is a really good one. I, I really, I, I, it it brings you back. You know, like you said, it helps you kind of understand other cases. Yeah. And I hope that people can take the take those type of um, pinpoints and just like look at the cases and try to maybe figure out which one they are and maybe have a discussion over because like that's and be able to see it before it happens to prevent correct. the future for sure well i appreciate you guys for sticking with us this was we did kind of a couple longer ones the last few so um if you like the content please feel free to like follow subscribe share leave a comment leave a review tell your friends everything until, yeah until next time stay safe make good choices and we'll see you bye bye guys I love you, 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 I love